Um, welcome to this session about Kubernetes or not with uh, Drupal. And the answer to this question is, uh, 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 our answer is yes. Um, but uh, before we dive into that, uh, let's go uh, to the agenda that we'll uh, talk about. Uh, I will talk about uh, us, uh, that's me uh, and uh, my uh, moderator here, and where we work. What is Kubernetes? So uh, K8S is like the, the short term for Kubernetes. Uh, why do we use it? Uh, how can you use it? Um, talk about stateful or stateless. Oh, I see that's uh, agenda. Uh, Point number five is just a little bit earlier, but we'll talk about the difference between those two and, and what did we at Synetic chose. And then we have a, a small part for the questions. Um, please try to, to um, um, wait for questions till the end uh, because, um, well, we only have like 30 minutes. Um, so who are we? Well, this is Daniel Smith. He's the guy who would do this presentation and he, uh, yeah, is not here or maybe he is here but he is not able to do the presentation because he decided to headbutt a shelf and has a concussion so um last uh, yesterday uh, uh, we talked about it and i uh, yeah managed to create a presentation real quick about what we have done uh, the last couple of days um he's our cto uh, also a drupal contributor uh, and a core maintainer for inline form hours um and uh, you see be, uh, below his name, see, you see uh, learner, deliberative, analytical, relator, and achiever. Uh, at Synetic, we use a strength-based uh, human resource uh, program to uh, help people develop. And these five strengths are his uh, top five strengths uh, uh, that define him. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Bertoon, uh, solution architect. Also, uh, yeah, and and. and Drupal contributor for projects, uh, I do media bulk upload. Uh, that's, I think, one of the most popular modules that I maintain. The pre-process module, previewer, a new one, icons, big pipe paragraphs, also a new one. Check it out, it, it makes your main content uh, loading fly, by the way. Color swatch, fly system, Drupal cache, which uh, comes by later on. And um, we're well, pretty much obsessed with DevOps and stuff. Uh, stuff because I hate doing uh, things uh, uh, repeatedly. Um, and my sidekick and moderator today uh, is Dan. Dan is uh, uh, our DevOps engineer and uh, yeah, our powerhouse uh, behind our whole hosting platform that we have uh, adopted and set up. Uh, the last year, it was his main goal and task to do this. And in this session, we will talk about learnings that we have done actually in the, off, uh, in the last couple of two years, because before he came to us back, because he left Synetic uh, a couple of years ago, but he came back. Um, before that, uh, me and Daniel also tried to set up a hosting platform with Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, uh, we had some learnings about that and decided to do it another way. And that's where uh, Dan came in. And besides working at Synetic, he's also a fireman. So he's also kind of a hero. Uh, high five for Dan. Uh, this is our company. Uh, yeah, we, we are uh, yeah like a digital family. That's what we call us. Uh, uh, people and the employee uh, are most important for us and uh, our personal development as well. Um, so uh, yeah, we work in Harlem uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, we work for yeah many different clients from from um, healthcare or pharmaceutical companies to uh, smaller uh, uh, foundations, uh, you name it, we try to build websites, but also applications. Uh, so it's not only Drupal development, it's also Symfony and Laravel and uh, JavaScript applications that we uh, try to commit to. Um, so the first topic, what is Kubernetes? And, um, this is the most technical uh, definition for Kubernetes, um, and, and it's um, an, uh, it's it's an orchestrator to manage uh, different applications software running on a set of resources, um, and also uh, yeah supply with with uh, scalability and high availability uh, high availability uh, options, um, and it's it's a new kind of technology for after the last couple of years that will be 
yeah, see coming back to and, and see as the main uses for, for new applications. Uh, companies like Spotify or Pokemon Go uh, use this uh, to, to uh, offer their services for uh, a lot of users because of its scalability. But it's kind of difficult to understand. Uh, I also put a, a number of source links below it for, for people who want to read into it. Um, uh, for this session, especially because there are a lot of people who know a little bit of, about Kubernetes, I'm trying to, to do it in layman terms. And uh, yeah, Kubernetes coordinates and adjusts all the different instruments and sections that make up a computer application sitting on the server. This is so it can respond to multiple users in a timely and efficient manner, even as demand fluctuates for different parts of an application. Still a bit difficult, but what you could do is think of it as um, Kubernetes is the owner of a concert hall, uh, designing to partition the space into smaller halls so that several orchestras can play like at the same time. Um, and the whole venue where the concert is, uh, is, is uh, held is more efficiently used. But uh, yeah, you get another, another problem with that because if you have several uh, rooms, you need several, or, uh, uh, several orchestras, uh, separate conductors, and uh, you have to run multiple concerts at the same time. Uh, it's not really uh, efficient. So here comes uh, Kubernetes, uh, like a genius, uh, who says, well, you know, why don't we uh, record and, and pre-build all the different or uh, concerts? And we use pro uh, projectors and uh, hologram projectors, for instance, to uh, display a concert when you need to. And that way, uh, when an audience wants to hear a certain concert in a certain uh, part of the, the, the venue, you can display it and uh, uh, play it. And that's what Kubernetes in, as, uh, in essence does. It spins up an image of an application like Drupal and uh, delivers it uh, to the user on demand using the, the resources that are available on the server. So when the performance of an application ends, it shuts it down or it scales down and freeing up the resources for maybe another application. I know WordPress or something uh, or whatever you use or uh, an Elasticsearch application, uh, you name it. Uh, Kubernetes can restage another one immediately to continue delivering the same performance to the same one. Um, so in, in the terms of an orchestra, it's not only a conductor, it's also like an automated super coordinator, um, managing multiple orchestras that play different uh, concerts in, in uh, different uh, parts of the venue, all happening at the same time. So I hope that's uh, uh, more uh, inclined to a visual uh, uh, metaphor uh, than the technical terms. Um, the resources in, in Kubernetes are based out of nodes and every node is like a physical or virtual machine containing CPU and RAM. And that's it. Uh, it does not do really that much. Uh, uh, and those are the resources that you can divide for your software, in fact. Uh, and all the nodes together that are grouped together form uh, like the cluster. Um, uh, so your cluster is like a pool of nodes. And uh, yeah, you can see this as your combined horsepower that you have available to run all your software. Uh, you can also, of course, have multiple clusters, but those are, well, uh, separated of each other. So you can't connect the containers within that network of within the cluster if you run software there. So it's really separated. The only way to expose it then is mostly through, yeah, API endpoints or stuff. Um, on the cluster, you can uh, mount your, your persistent storage uh, for, uh, I know, uploads of, of image files and stuff like that. Um, and um, yeah, that's about it. Um, but that's the resources. So how you run and separate like multiple projects uh, or software on, within that cluster. And to do that, you, um, uh, you can define a namespace. Uh, the namespace is like the, the project definition, uh, like a single Drupal project for a client. Um, and you can assign the necessary containers or services as they call it to uh, run on the cluster within that namespace. So you could see a single services like Apache Solar or an Elasticsearch or 
uh, for search, uh, Nginx or Apache, Apache for, for your web server and a PHP service to run the PHP code of Drupal, for instance. Um, those combined are your namespace and each of them are like a pod uh, containing the, the service. Um, and pods and containers are something that, that might be a little bit tricky to, to understand because a pod is not the same as a container. Uh, a pod is like a group of containers, possibly, um, if uh, necessary, because besides the, the container for like PHP, you might want to have something like Prometheus or Logstash to, to uh, monitor and send out metrics of your PHP container and send it to like some centralized system to monitor your application. Um, that way you have multiple containers in a pod. But uh, the best practice is to keep those pods as small as possible because when you want to scale, which is one of the benefits of Kubernetes, um, the, uh, the pod will scale and not a single container. So every resource that the pod needs will be exponentially be bigger uh, for each of the containers within. Um, and before all the, the namespace, of course, uh, you have an, like a load balancer who will manage the traffic and make sure that when you have a domain registered uh, and it will send, be sent to your cluster that it will reach uh, the, 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 uh, the right uh, application that you are hosting on Kubernetes. So in summary, uh, you have like two dimensions. You have on one hand the resources, which is your cluster with your nodes and your persistent file storage, um, which can scale. Uh, so your nodes can scale, like add, adding extra nodes which contain resources, uh, but something more uh, modern uh, possibility uh, these days is also vertical scaling, besides horizontal scaling, that you can increase the resources within a node. Uh, and the persistent storage for, for file storage, like a database or uh, image files. Then you have like the project definitions, it's more like a configuration level. Uh, and these are the applications or services that you want to host on Kubernetes, uh, which can also scale or more like uh, replicate in a, in a certain way, which means that uh, a pod can only be, exist within a single node. So if the node does not have enough resources, there are two ways to fix it or increase the available resources within the pod, which are available within the current node or move the pod to another resources if it needed, or you can duplicate maybe a pod, uh, but it's all based on uh, the settings and, and uh, the possibilities of that uh, software. But that's, well, that's the flexibility that you have with Kubernetes and the software that you run on it. Um, it sounds all fancy and, and technical and cool maybe, but why use it? Uh, what's the main benefit that you can get with this. And yeah, first of all, Kubernetes can run on almost any hosting environment. Um, so it's cloud neutral as they call it. You can run it on uh, AWS, you can run it on Azure, uh, uh, DigitalOcean, Google Cloud, self-hosted uh, on your Mac. Um, it offers scalability, almost true scalability, instead of what they might uh, sell you on a traditional VPS, because it really has like smart scaling within the configuration they, that you have. So if more resources or the load gets higher, it scales automatically. And that's something for, uh, yeah, for, for bigger platforms, uh, what is really interesting, uh, especially for like commerce websites that, uh, have a busy season during uh, Christmas that you want to uh, uh, make sure they don't go down during, uh, I don't know, Black Friday or something. Um, Self-recovery, if there's uh, like a fatal thing happening and, and a container uh, a pod shuts down, it, it uh, makes sure it can uh, be restarted. Um, it's widely supported with all kinds of services. So you name it, it can run it uh, from Nginx, Apache, PHP, Redis, Solar to, I don't know, think of something like even a CLI tool. I think there are even Docker images that can run Drush, purely Drush. So you can run it on your cluster. Flexibility, yeah, because you have so many possibilities to run different services, uh, you, you can choose how to set up a, a, a software so you're not uh, if you are like an agency only focused on Drupal, but you want to extend and do other stuff as well, it's easy to, to add that to the cluster because it's focused on 
single project with their configuration and services. So you can run easily another project uh, next to it with different services. Um, and uh, instead of an, an, like a shared hosting environment where you often are limited to certain versions of, I don't know, PHP or Solar, uh, this is something you can decide all by yourself. So you can choose what to run um, if those are already available, like on Docker Hub, or you can create your own image even. Um, and another thing uh, what's important to realize is uh, the difference between stateful and stateless. And that's also something which makes Drupal hosting on Kubernetes somewhat of a challenge because um, you need file storage because as a content editor, you can upload your files. You can um, change content which are stored in the database and the database changes over. Um, the thing is that uh, Kubernetes is, is, is a modern technology um, and uh, built with not Drupal in mind. <laughs> and Drupal uh, was not created with Kubernetes as a hosting solution in mind. Um, and an application uh, that, works, uh, that works the best with Kubernetes is uh, in fact a stateless application because you can easily replicate them horizontally and, and, and therefore increase the uh, without uh, any issues and offer uh, yeah high performance um, but that's only possible if you do not have like the, an, an storage system that's necessary to give the the yeah the current state of the application and in uh, Drupal or even a WordPress or uh, most CMS you're really dependent on your database storage uh, for an actual user database uh, to log in and your content, also your, your images uh, and stuff like that. Um, so uh, in this example, uh, yeah, databases in Drupal, uh, those are really uh, stateful and, and stateless could be like Redis or Memcache. Uh, and also on Reactor Vue, you have front ends that only communicate with a certain API. Um, why Redis and Memcache, they can be stateful uh, when you want persistent storage linked to them and store like the information in Redis when it goes down that when Redis comes back up that the same cache items are still exist. But uh, in the case of a Drupal environment, you often use Redis and Memcache for uh, volatile caching data that can be cleaned if necessary and can be easily re rebuilt um, by user uh, uh, visitors. Um, so that's like the difference. Um, so uh, why is it important? Uh, mostly because of the horizontal, uh, horizontal scalability, because every replication clone of an application needs to have access to the same data to function. Um, it would be weird if you have like a, a Drupal environment that scales horizontal and it's the same, same website, but some have access to uh, uploaded images by a content editor and some don't, and it won't be output to, to a certain user and you see all kinds of missing images or CSS files or whatever is generated on that end. Um, and this is somewhat difficult within Kubernetes in dockerized environments. Uh, it's something that is being developed and there are a lot of cloud native um, solutions on, that are being developed to ho hopefully solve this. Um, but yeah, um, what I already say, Drupal and, and other kind of applications are not really um, built with this in mind. Um, what you can see, for instance, is that like databases are, can't be, almost can be stateless. It's very difficult. There are some like CouchDB or something is, is something that's, uh, follows 12 factor uh, uh, system to do this, I think, but mostly uh, MongoDB, MySQL and stuff like that, they, they need some persistent storage to, to make sure that every instance of MySQL, uh, even if it's uh, load balanced and uh, that they have the same database. Um, and when it goes down that they have the same data uh, available to them. And yeah, uh, the systems mostly used to, to fix this are like NFS or, or Gluster FS. And those do have some kind of latency. They're pretty performant and, and, and it's doable, uh, but it's not really the fastest way to do this. Um, but it, it's, it's acceptable and it's something that most uh, solutions currently in the market use. Um, Drupal, yeah, 
well, with Drupal, you have the issue of uh, the file system, um, which you also can uh, solve with NFS, ClusterFS, or, or other solutions. But uh, for the most scalable solution that doesn't really mount like a physical disk through NFS on, on a cluster, you could use block storage. And block storage, you could think about like a Google bucket or Amazon S3. Um, and within Drupal, you have the Fly System API, which is an, 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 a PHP library with a module to, to enable it within Drupal to store your images or your CSS and YAML script within uh, those uh, block storage. And with block storage, you can easily horizontal scale the, the capacity that you need for your storage uh, without uh, the need to, to modify your cluster or uh, mount any uh, disks. So making it more stateless within your Kubernetes environment. Uh, for this, we also uh, added some contrips, uh, one single contrip, and we maintain since uh, this week also the Fly System uh, Google Cloud Storage module, but we built the Fly System Drupal Cache version. And the Fly System Drupal ca Cache version is something you could check out. It also works excellent for, for non-Kubernetes environments. And what it actually does is it has a uh, page like page cache like system to uh, store the CSS and JavaScript within Redis or your database cache within Drupal or Memcache or whatever caching mechanism uh, you have integrated within uh, Drupal, and uh, with uh, an extra uh, kernel layer, we uh, give the CSS and JavaScript back. Uh, as soon as we can, and it's e uh, sometimes even faster than uh, running it from file, uh, like a default, uh, like the default does within Drupal. So it's easy to to yeah uh, store your aggregated CSS in JavaScript outside of a cluster in something that you maybe host uh, separate. Um, oh yeah, and about the database, there's also something that's interesting. Uh, besides containerizing your database, you can also uh, use uh, managed services like MySQL, MongoDB through uh, a provider like Google. So Cloud SQL uh, is something that's really uh, scalable, uh, really performant, and you can connect this with your uh, cluster environment to run your uh, Drupal database. Um, how can you use Kubernetes? Um, well, there are a few um, few uh, options, few levels. You got the on-premise, um, and that's the most custom version how you can uh, set up Kubernetes. Um, so you need to do everything. So if you see the image on the right, everything that's blue is like things that you need to uh, figure out yourself if you uh, do that level of, of Kubernetes management. So on-premise or uh, installing it on a VPS or whatever, you need to do everything from installing Kubernetes to setting it up, configuring it, uh, but also setting up a cluster, your nodes, and, and also connect, of course, a uh, release management tool to the environment to release your application. Uh, infrastructure as a service, then you don't have to manage your Kubernetes, you manage your cluster and then the available resources. Um, still a lot of configuration, uh, but it's easily done mostly with uh, cloud providers like uh, Google Cloud, uh, AWS, Azure, and DigitalOcean. And uh, they give you a pretty solid UI for ma managing your cluster and adding new nodes and also having like interfaces for monitoring like uh, errors or stuff like that. And then and the third one is a platform as a service. Uh, yes, here even the infrastructure uh, is managed and often also hosted on something like Google Cloud. Um, but here you just have to worry about your project and connecting it to uh, that platform. Um, and you could see like Pantheon and Platform uh, as a, or uh, Amazi as uh, those kind of uh, services um, where they have like, uh, yeah, uh, predefined setups to, to run your application on a uh, Kubernetes environment. Um, for on-premise ability and how you want to set up uh, Kubernetes, but, uh, and you have an own choice of containers and how to set up the cluster. But we learned that uh, we tried, yeah, we, we looked into it. And this is the first thing that we thought of is that it's not what you want as an agency. Uh, you have a really high investment in time, people and knowledge. Um, 
you need to hire people for this, uh, you need to maintain it, you need to update all the, the software that runs uh, Kubernetes and also manage, of course, the whole security layer of it. <coughs> um, and it takes a lot of time to research what you need to, to create uh, and service your applications before you can even start uh, offering it to your clients. Um, infrastructure as a service, yeah, you don't need to worry about the whole uh, Kubernetes cluster set uh, of Kubernetes management setup, but you need to set up your clusters, figure out how you want to scale, how you want to divide your containers or, or projects, uh, manage how you want to uh, go with, with persistent storage. I see, like Leonard also uh, says, yeah, you can use also Amazon for uh, EFS, uh, true. Uh, but that, those are stuff that you also need to figure out if you want to uh, use a AWS or Google Cloud, uh, AWS is uh, with, with a release or setup of a deployment uh, what's slower than Google Cloud, and you need to figure this all out by yourself. Uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, it's less time than doing a, a whole setup yourself, but uh, you have still control over your cluster, which is also kind of an, uh, an advantage if you want that flexibility but it takes also a lot of time to manage it. Uh, it requires also dedicated people to manage it. Um, and you have no control over your setup of Kubernetes. Um, and the last one, platform as a service. Uh, yeah, you often get a UI to manage your projects. Uh, you don't ha really have to think about your containers because they yeah, are, are pretty defined within uh, those services. Um, uh, Kubernetes is managed, cluster is managed, uh, and they offer uh, yeah, extra services that are simplified and are mostly also agency focused, like uh, uh, CDN um, and, and uh, uh, WAF or, or other extras, monitoring, uh, you name it. Uh, uh, the cons, though, as uh, uh, a pro, actually, uh, it's lowest investment in time. Uh, and people, uh, so that's the wrong bullet point uh, section, but it's also pro that the, the investment is lower. Uh, you don't need to have a lot of people who know how the platform works and the, the knowledge you need to gain is uh, is uh, yeah not as steep as the other two options. Custom containers are not always possible. They are with Amazi, by the way, um, but with Pantheon and platform, it's uh, as, as far as I know, it isn't possible. They have like just setups or uh, hosting plans that you can take. Also, just offer scalability when going enterprise, while Amazi does it from uh, the base uh, uh, level. Um, and yeah, your your like stuff like file storage uh, is mostly also predefined. So yeah, you could use block storage because in S3 or a Google uh, bucket is like API first. So you you connect with it through an API, but Besides that, you can't easily switch between uh, file storage systems. Um, what did we chose? Well, uh, we chose platform as a service, of course, because we're an agency and uh, we're not a hosting provider, uh, but we do want to offer a stable and, uh, and, and a secure environment for our clients that we can manage and also have some control over. Um, we did some business uh, analysis about different platform as a service companies, and we came out with Amazi. And for us, the reason ever is, is yeah, the NFS storage solution that they use is, uh, they use Google Cloud mostly, um, that works, uh, it's stable, they manage it, it scales. Um, they have CDN integration, WAF integration. They are as a company, because they're like a, a sister company of Amazi Labs, really Drupal minded. Um, Custom containers are also possible. They also host like Java applications or uh, custom Java applications or Node.js or whatever. So they're really flexible in what they can offer. Um, also the way that they set it up, you can easily create dynamic test environments. Um, for us at Synetic, we have like two, two streams of development. We've got like the service desk, which create like uh, uh, bug fixes or small changes. But we also have sometimes parallel on it, uh, running sprints. And sometimes with a fixed test acceptation and production environment, we often uh, yeah, have like a conflict in, in what comes first or uh, accidentally releasing an, an, 
an, a, a service desk branch to an acceptation environment while Sprint is being accepted by a client, stuff like that. Now, with this option, we get dynamic test environments, which we can easily uh, run parallel without any conflicts. Um, also, what we like is that you pay, pay what you use. Uh, their subscription is based on a base fee plus uh, the number of requests that are being run on, on the platform. So that's the more uh, request to the platform uh, or uh, to your project, the more you pay. But uh, as an agency, you can group all your clients together in one pool of requests. So the more clients you run, um, the less you pay for each request. So that's also very interesting from a cost perspective. Um, they're open source minded. They use like a Lagoon uh, tool. That's a Lagoon.io, I think I'm from uh, the top of my head which is the software that they use to maintain and interact with Kubernetes. Um, it's a GraphQL front end uh, that they have built and it's all open source and they're really open source minded. And they're also really helpful in discussing and seeing uh, for new possibilities. And also their community within of all clients are really open. And they have like a Slack channel where you can uh, discuss with each other or even share IDs. Um, and they even offer support or, or help to uh, go self-hosted. So if you start with like running it uh, as a platform and uh, you want to uh, yeah, be more of the owner and you want to have your own department that does hosting, they can help you in setting this up and, and transfer the Lagoon uh, projects to your own Lagoon instance and manage it on your own uh, cloud provider of your choice. Um, and that's also one thing that misses here, actually, and that's uh, the fact that uh, Amazi has also like a cloud neutral uh, setup in mind. So if you have like a client that uh, wants to run on their own Azure, it is possible or on premise or on digital ocean, they can support it. Of course, the whole setup will be somewhat uh, more expensive because they need to set up it on a private cluster, but it is also possible. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I think the time already is uh, uh, half hour spent. Are there any questions, uh, Dan? Uh, yes, I have one of uh, Niels van Aken. Um, he was asking about um, yeah when uh, you have uh, some uh, stateful DB uh, like Maria Bay, the Bay, you um, uh, yeah, you, you will get some performance issues uh, when you are hosting uh, with NFS or something in inside uh, QNEEDS. But I think uh, you also can look at solutions um, yeah, when, on, when you are uh, on-premise, uh, you're a little bit on your own and you have to experiment uh, that. That's not what we uh, did until now. Um, yep. Uh, we have some MySQL databases inside Kubernetes, but uh, those are with uh, storage on the machine itself. Uh, but they're uh, for the test environment, so it's not uh, very worse when uh, that data, data disappears. Yeah. Um, yeah, and MAC, they, they offer like even on premise with managed services. So, yeah. Uh, if you run it on premise uh, with NFS, it still it, it can still be performance enough for for a platform. Um, and um, they have like a high available Galera setup, I think, like the right down at Amazi. Yeah, so, yeah. so they have like a master slave construction to to improve performance as well. And NFS is still pretty performant though, but it's yeah, it's not as not as fast as native uh, disk mounting, of course. Now you also can look at uh, when you are uh, on-premise that you create a, a separate database cluster uh, aside of your Kubernetes so you don't have the, um, uh, the struggles with NFS or something. Yep. I think the time has passed and the next session will start. Um, sorry for not managing the time maybe well enough. If you have any questions, come to our booth. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, you can uh, even go in depth with us uh, about it and maybe even uh, help you with setting up uh, your own environment, of course. So thank you. Um, and uh, have fun today with Drupal Jam and tomorrow. Have fun.